All right. Good morning, everybody. Um, good afternoon, if you're joining us from Greece, like our esteemed speaker today. My name is Katie Petroli. I am the Assistant Director at the Parthenon in Nashville, Tennessee. Um, I'm delighted to have you here today to join us for a virtual symposium um, with our speaker, Sylvie Dumont. So allow me to thank a couple people, then I'll introduce Sylvie. Sylvie will tell us all about her uh, talk today, and then we'll have time for some questions at the end. So um, today's symposium is inspired by an exhibit called The Role of a Replica at the Parthenon. It's um, supported by a grant from Humanities Tennessee and um, also sponsored by Centennial Park Conservancy and Metro Nashville Parks and Recreation. The exhibit is all about how we learn about the past, how we learn about ancient Greece, um, specifically through casts, copies, and replicas. And so um, I think our talk today will be a fun comparison to hear about a replica in Greece and to hear about um, an early period of excavation history um, that was a little later period in time. So it's a little different talk today, but we'll be hearing about the Agora from Sylvie Dumont. During the talk today, um, if you have any questions, you can use the chat function at the bottom of your screen or the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen. And at the end of the symposium, I'll be relaying those questions to Sylvie so that we can make sure that your burning questions and thoughts about our talk are answered. So we will have time for questions at the end. All right, allow me to introduce our speaker. So Sylvie Dumont studied classical archeology span as an undergrad, but moved to Greece in 1985, where she started working as an illustrator um, for four summers and then began her career with the Athenian Agora excavations, working as a secretary all the way to registrar before her retirement less than a year ago in March 2023. I had the pleasure of working with Sylvie for my very first internship at the Agora excavations. Um, Gosh, about 15 years ago today. So Sylvie, without further ado, please, we are excited to hear from you. Feel free to share your screen and begin. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Okay. yes. So, good afternoon to you if you are in America. And thank you for inviting me to make this presentation about the Agora. So first I should explain what is an Agora. The Agora is a large open square at the foot of the Acropolis, you can see on the screen now. And it played an important role in all aspects of civic life of Athens with the creation of a system of government that we know as democracy today. It served as the hub for significant institutions such as the Senate, the public offices, the archive, law courts, and additionally, the Agora feature a concert hall, a library, and temples and shrines dedicated to the worship of gods. But this gathering place also serves as a public market. In fact, the Greek word Agora translates to market. The discovery of many shops and workshops support this evidence. Street vendors would set up stands to offer the product for sale and building like the stoa, you can see one on the left, would provide shelter. So we can say without a doubt that the Agora was the center of Athens. But if you may visit it today as an archeological site, it was very different 100 years ago. In the beginning of the 20th century, the area was covered by a working class neighborhood, also lively occupied with shops, groceries, coffee shop, restaurants, and cinemas. So I don't know if you can see the temple at the left, the Titian temple with a square, and the, the Grisaki neighborhood will be a little bit at the bottom of the temple. What you see in the foreground is still there. You have the church of Aya Marina, and on the right, you have the Tision uh, neighborhood. 
So we will start with a short historical background, though, for the audience that might not be familiar with the modern history of Greece. In 1453, after the fall of Constantinople, that we know as Istanbul today, Greece became part of the Ottoman Empire for about 400 years. In 1821, the Greeks declared their independence, but it took many years of struggle before Greece was officially recognized as an independent and sovereign state in 1830. In May 1832, the Greek powers of Europe of that period, Britain, France, and Russia, established the Kingdom of Greece under the rule of a young prince named Otto. Otto was a son of King Ludwig I of Bavaria. Ludwig was a romantic of his time. He was a patron of art, a collector, and most important, a great admirer of ancient Greece. So he was very influential in the decision of Athens being chosen as the new capital of Greece. Because Athens was not the only choice. Other city had been suggested like Napoleon in South Peloponnese and even Constantinople itself. The academic world had followed closely the development of the revolution and after the liberation of Athens was very involved in its reconstruction. It soon became an European concern for the intellectual and the artist who expected that the preservation of ancient monuments would be given priority. The reconstruction of Athens represents a unique opportunity for Greeks and for foreign architects to remodel one of the brightest cities into a modern metropolis inspired by the adoration of antiquity that was prevalent in the Romanticism movement. This movement had orig originated in Europe towards the end of the 18th century, and it was at its peak when the planning of the new town was being under study. Few propositions had been made for the reconstruction of Athens, but finally, in June 1833, a city plan devised by two friends, a, a Greek and a Prussian, was approved. Stamantios Cleantes and Edouard Schubert were both architects and they had studied in Berlin under a famous Prussian architect, Friedrich Schinkel, who was also a city planner and a fervent follower of the Romantic movement. If Cleantis and Chauvet had followed their master inspiration, this is what the Acropolis would, would have looked like today. So you see here is a plan of the Acropolis. And uh, you have number 45 is the Parthenon. You have the dependence on the right, the palace and gardens. And a number 47, it's even an hippodrome. So you can imagine what the Acropolis would look like. Fortunately, the two young men were more slightly sensitive, sensible, sorry. The idea of the two architects was to rebuild in large part the new capital outside the fortification wall and excavate a significant portion of the existing city to reveal Athens and restore it to its ancient splendor. In this project, they aim to create a large archaeological park that would preserve the monument from all periods, not only classical and Hellenistic, but also Roman, Frankish, and Byzantine remains. So here we have a plan of Athens in 1826. You can see how small it is. And it has a round shape. You can see the, the Acropolis at the bottom, if you can see it. And the fortification for wall around it. The the red line they show they show you the main a, a little triangle that I draw there. It, they define the two main streets of the area that was expropriated in 1931 by the American school. This is to give you an idea where the agora is located today. At the edge, you may discern the Titian Temple on the top of the small hill. It's little, I don't know if you, I can show you the, yeah, here it is. So this is a temple and this, the, the Agora today would be that, that area. Now here we have a plan of Cleantis and Schubert. 
So in red is the proposed area uh, for excavation, which is basically the Agora on the west, if you can see the little triangle again. And on the east, you have what is the, the area called today still Placa. You may also discern yeah, the triangle, sorry. The, and um, in dark gray above it, this is the layout of the new city that had basically determined the modern layout of Athens and its future development. If you are in Athens and consult a city map today, you would see that triangular configuration with at the apex, Omona Square, Omonia Square, and at the bottom right, Syntagma Square, where the parliament is today. So here is Omonia, and here would be Syntagma, where is the part that was the palace, and then it became the parliament today. So the prospect of such a large array of the city free of buildings was quite radical, considering that in 1833, the area of Athens inside the fortification was about 300 acres. To give you an idea, an acre is a, one acre is the size of a football field. And the proposed archaeological zone at the foot of the Acropolis represent about one third of that surface. But the city was largely destroyed, and it did not seem impossible to achieve such a project. Apart from this romantic ideal, the westernization of Athens thought to symbolize a rebirth of the entire country. It would celebrate the unity of the nation by elevating the history of Greek civilization and promoting Greece's ancient past by recreating Athens into a contemporary city that would be part of Europe. But the reality was different for the population who did not have a place to go. Many people had settled in makeshift shacks and most of them did not have the means to build a new house with the meager compensation that was offered to them. Because the moment Athens was declared the official capital of Greece, it prompted a frenzy of construction but also the speculation of the land and the price started to escalate. Given the limited economic resources of the newly established Greek state, the cost of expropriation proved to be a significant burden. There were also a lot of complaints and discontent among the owners. So in 1836, a decree permitted the population to temporarily rebuild on this area. And this is why the neighborhood was still there in 1931. However, the owners were informed that eventual expropriation awaited them and they were denied the full use of their property. In 1834, according to the census, when King Otto arrived in Athens in December of that year, the population was about 7,000. And in 1836, when they permitted to rebuild in this area, the population had doubled to 14,000. In the meantime, the creation of the Greek Archaeological Service in 1833, the founding of the Archaeological Society of Athens in 1837, and the decrees for the protection of antiquities issued during the reign of King Otto, attest to the great concern for the preservation of antiquities. The Acropolis was the principal beneficiary of these efforts. Until 1830, it has been used as a fortification. It was then cleaned or cleansed from remains of later period. And in 1835, it was the actual first archeological site to be open to the public. But it became evident that the entire zone plan for excavation by Cleantis and Schubert couldn't be fully realized. However, the fervent desire to uncover the ancient city persisted and locating the Agora was one of the main purpose owing to its significance in the birth of democracy. The Greek Archaeological Society made numerous attempts to excavate the area on the north side of the Acropolis. And during the second part of the 19th century, they expropriate and excavated few properties. However, it was economically impossible to expropriate the entire neighborhood at once. So I'm going to show you some images of the excavation that were done. This is what is called the city Eleusinion. It was excavating between 1848 and 1851. And here is the same 
excavation in, in 1936, uh, just before the excavation of the American school. Here we have the, what is called the stoa of the giant, which were excavated between 1855 and 1858. They were on the ruins of the, they were, no, sorry, but the giants were built on the ruins of the Odeon of Agrippa. It was called, they were called giants because on their pedestal, they reached three meters. Here we have the view of the Stoa Vatalos ruins. So we have the north part. I don't know if you can see the wall. Um, there's a wall standing up to the to the roof, and here is the south part with the doorways of three rooms. The Soa Vatalos was excavated between 1859 and 1902, and then we have this area just at the bottom of the Tisian. We can see here the the temple here in this area in color. They were excavated by the German Archaeological Institute in 1895 and 1896. While the uh, Dorfel was, was responsible for this excavation and while he was excavating this area, he was also exploring the slope of the Acropolis in order to find the Agora because everybody was looking for the Agora. The Archaeological Society bought the other properties and continued the excavation on that lot in 1907 and 1908. And here we have an, an, an image of 1931. You see the at the bottom of the temple. This is exactly the um, the area that was excavated at the beginning of the century. So with the prospect of the first modern Olympic games in 1896, all efforts were focused on the beautification of Athens and its monument. Many dwellings surrounding antiquities were removed and according to the first Greek law protecting antiquities that was drawn in 1899, the prohibition of constructing new buildings near antiquities was legally enhanced. So here we have an idea of people living among ruins. And here we are in the middle of the Toa Vatalos. And we have, we can see this statue in the middle. This it's now in this, on the site of the Agora. And here we have a view of the giant again. So here there were, they have been, uh, Three of them have been reinstalled on their pedestal and enclosed by stone wall crowned by an iron railing. So this is an image of 1910. So you have an idea also of the neighborhood here. So in the early 20s, the mass arrival of a million of refugees caused by the Balkan War and the dissolution of the Ottoman Empire create a serious housing crisis in Athens. So the value of land and building consistently increased, and it was clear that the area set aside for excavation had to be expropriated quickly, or owners should would have to be allowed to exploit and build on their lot. So in 1920, for example, the population of Athens was 243,000, and in 1931, it was 600,000. So you can imagine the increasing housing problem. So a concerted attempt to secure the zone was made in July 1924 when a bill for the necessary expropriation of the area was presented to the assembly. But the bill was rejected due to the cost to the Greek state, which was once more not in a position to fund such a large economic project. To avoid the annulation of the project altogether, the government decided to approach the foreign archaeological school in Athens. One idea was to assign different zones to each school. At the time, 
the French school, the German school, the American school, and the British school were the first school established in Latin in the 19th century. But after World War I, however, the economic climate of the European school in Athens was not favorable to bearing such expenses. So with the encouragement from the Greek government, the director of the American school, Bert Hodge Hill, made an offer in December 1924. Edward Capps, the chairman of the managing committee of the school, was authorized to begin negotiation and locate sources of financial support for the project. The Rockefeller Foundation was approached and John Rockefeller Jr. was convinced to participate financially in the excavation of the Agora. He was known for his generous philanthropy and after much deliberation came to an agreement with the school in 1927. One of the main problems was the funding again. The school had to provide funds not only for the expropriation of the land, but for the compensation of the owners and the tenant. According to the catalog of the school, there were 144 small enterprises like shoemakers, grocery, restaurant, coffee shop, even three cinema. But the school didn't want to become the richest owner of Athens by buying all that land and where the excavation might never happen at the end. So it was concluded that the school would provide the funds for the expropriation and the excavation expense, but the expropriation had to be executed on the name of the Greek state. The more difficult aspect of the excavation, of course, was the expropriation. After the creation of a title inspection committee, I'm sorry, the owner had to bring their deeds and relinquish their right to the Greek state. An evaluation committee would then evaluate the compensation to be given according to the acreage of the lot and the buildings. Land and buildings were evaluated separately, and of course, the value would decrease according to age and wear. But the owner had the right to go to appeal if they, not, they did not agree with the price. The other main problem was the size of the zone. Few propositions were made by Dr. Hill, and he was hoping to excavate as far as the Tower of the Wind, which is in a Roman agora, if you know a little bit above Athens. But the cost was so high that Edward Capps proposed to separate the zone in two. So it was decided to create an American zone at the west and a Greek zone, which was slightly smaller at the east side. The Stratellus was about the central borderline. After five years of difficult and complicated negotiation between Edward Capps and the Greek government, the conversion of a section of Athens into an archaeological site was approved in a law called Law 4212, was published in July 1929. Here is a plan showing, not a very good plan, but it shows you in yellow, Cleantis and Schubert uh, plan. That was the original plan in 1833. You have in green the proposal by Bert Hill, who, who wanted to excavate up to the uh, power of the wind. And in red, you have the uh, area uh, depicted by the law, which was separated in two. I don't know if you can see here, it's. Here is the triangle again, and you have here the straw of Atalos would be here, and you have here the separation would be here. So we can see that the area for excavation is quite smaller than the one by Cleantis and Schubert. Ah, here I have a map. We, we made a digital map, but it doesn't come very neatly on the screen. It's very high resolution. Uh, so here we have the triangle again, and you have the east side with the Library of Adrian and the Tower of the Wind here. So, and here is the American zone it was finally excavated. So Risaki was a very crowded, densely populated working class district. Description of Risaki, whether by a minister or archeologist presented their neighborhood as filthy, 
and unsanitary area. Such description account for why it was considered to be run down like other neighborhoods in a working class area located in the western outskirts of the city. So its disappearance was not thought to be a significant loss. One minister even said it would be a blessing to get rid of that neighborhood that pollute the view of the Acropolis. So here are some images of the neighborhood again. So I show you a little bit the density of the neighborhood. You have the Acropolis in the background, so it was polluting the view, as you can see. And here again, I'll show you the, the one I showed you before. I don't know if you can see there's a, there's a screen here. So there was a cinema, a summer cinema by the temple. According to a census made in 1921, the population of the American Union was about 8,000. As for the houses, by the end of 1939, 348 property had been expropriated. This number is based on the cadastre, not by the number of proprietors, of which there could be more than one per lot. So I look at contracts, and there's often many, many owners of one house or one lot. Additionally, often more than one house per lot as well. And if we calculate 375 one story, 248 two stories, and only two three stories buildings, the total number of house would be 625 dwellings. But they were, as I said, uh, 348 properties. Here, so we see again a panorama with the crop with the the capitus in the back. And in this neighborhood, there were four churches that remained standing in 1931 and two serving as parish church. The Holy Apostle, you can see here. So the Holy Apostle was the only Byzantine church and had this modern extension that would be demolished uh, after the war. And the other church was Vlasaru, you see part, part of it here, the Panaya Vlasaru, uh, Virgin Vlasaru, here after the demolition of some houses around. And we're going to look at some street. This is Posidona Street. Here is Ptolemeo Street. Here is Apollodoro, this one couldn't come there. So it is this very narrow street uh, that was leading to the Acropolis. And now the narrow street, San Dionysios. And here we have a store at the junction of Ariokago and Guleftiriu. So you can see all the name of the street. They were renamed by Friedrich Stauffer, another Bavarian who was architect of Athens between 1835 and 1841. So the name of the street are inspired by antiquity and only two by the name of a church. So you can see again the influence of the romantic movement at the time. So by seeing this narrow street, you can imagine how this neighborhood was perceived by the official. Many houses were in the decrepit stage, for example. But we had nice neoclassical house like this house uh, that were built, normally they were built at the end of the 19th century. Actually, this is a view that you would have uh, while entering the Agora site in 1931 from Adrianu. So when you enter the site today from Adrianu, in a hundred years ago, you would have seen those. And this is actually when I was showing you the triangle that I kept telling you about, it's the apex of the triangle. So we are at the top of the two street, Eponymon and Areopago Street. 
So finally, the excavation started in May uh, 1901, sorry, 1931, and progressed accordingly to the demolition of the house by block. The section of the excavation were established according to the existing street layout and were named with letters of the Greek alphabet. 45 section has been excavated between 1931 and 1939, and tons and tons of earth has been removed. You have to think that the, ex the uh, excavation is about 12 meters down from the level of the street. So only in 1935, 30, 1,000 tons of earth has been removed. Here is the map of the uh, excavation. It was published in Esperia in 1937, showing the progress of the excavation. So we have, you can see the, the letter of the section has been added in ink. So they start with alpha, beta, gamma, delta, and then they didn't have enough letters. So they start to double the letter, like lambda, lambda, kappa, kappa, etc. So in 1940, the work had been to be suspended because of the war. But according to the law 4212, the school had 10 years to find the Agora, build a museum, and was obligated to convert the area into a park. Fortunately, in 1938, they had found the boundary stone in situ. So at least that was settled. So they knew they had found the Agora. In 1946, upon their return after the war, archaeologists focused exclusively on completing excavation and cleaning up the site. Additionally, some sections in the Greek zone were allocated to the American school to unify the shape of the site, so we did more square. Here we have a view of the site in 1950. So it shows you that it's completely bare now. We can see um, the giant here, a little bit standing. And here the Church of the Holy Apostle. The rooms of the Stoa Vatelos is here, but it's only the foundation. You can see a little bit of the wall. And here on the left, there's a complex of houses that were kept by the archaeologists. Uh, for offices, laboratories, uh, storage rooms as well. And this was demolished uh, just after, uh, in 1957, after the construction of the Astro Vatalus. So they cleaned, they found the Agora. Now they had to build a museum and landscape, make a park. So, but where to build a museum? A large area, the southwest edge of the site, somewhere here, sorry, here, was designed for building the future museum. But the discovery of residential and industrial area of the classical period was too important to be covered by modern construction. So the idea of reconstructing on the foundation of the Stoa Vatelos was suggested, they say, by Omer Tansen, who was the second director of the Agora. And finally, the, the challenge was accepted, and Rockefeller was approached again for the money. The transformation of the area into an archaeological park began with the restoration of the Byzantine Church of the Holy Apostle, the reconstruction of the store and the landscaping. The store was completed in 1956 and was inaugurated in September of that year. So here we have a view of the store, the foundation. You can see at the at the north side, you see the wall here, it goes up to the roof. So they knew it was a two two stories. And at the south side, they had four doorways. The The last one is, is going to a stairwell to go to the upstairs. And the other three were uh, rooms. The, 
the store of Cornelina are usually one story high. And the function of a store is to provide shelter promenade. The store of Atos was quite large, it was 100, uh, I tell you in feet probably, uh, 377 feet by 66 feet, or 115 meters by 20 meters, and had two stories as they figure out with the stairwell. On each of its two stories, it had a colonnade backed by a row of 21 rooms. So these three doorways were telling them that they were little rooms which serve as shops, probably rented by the state to individuals in antiquity. So basically it was kind of a, of a mall, a shopping center. The modern store is a faithful replica of the building, of the ancient building, based on its original foundation. Also the northern and southern ends remain to the height of the second floor and allow the architect to reconstruct the building to the same height as the original building. So here we have a closer view to the... So here is the, the entrance to the stairwell, still today, and uh, the three, three rooms. And here we have a view of the reconstruction. So they use local uh, material, pendelic marble, and uh, there was a stone from Piraeus. So everything was uh, exactly uh, reconstructed based on the actual foundation and on the size of the original one. And here we have the stoa. Uh, after completion. So you can see here that the stairwell was also a stairwell on both sides. And today, fortunately, they have opened the upper story and you can visit it and come from one side to the other. The sheds in the far is just a working shed for the for doing the models and working models on in wood. Here's another view after remove remove all of the one shed. And there are so many stones, they made those piles of stone uh, that we can still see today. So the um, the store was in a way, um, inaugurated in September 1956. And here we have the um, Holy Apostle again with the modern extension. And with after the um, removal of the extent in 1956. So they had to, so that was the second uh, thing they had to do, and the landscaping. So the, the landscaping here we have a view of the site, it's quite bare, and then you have here. Oh, sorry. Here is the um, view of the land. This is a watercolor made by uh, Griswold that uh, is a design of the, the landscape for the central part of the Agora. So today the SOA serve as a museum to house all of the archaeological finds, but also provides space for a gallery open to the public giving the visitor the sensation of strolling in an ancient building and walking in the heart of Athens. It was clear that the ancient agora of Athens was extending further to the north side, and in 1970 and 1980, more property was expropriated by the Greek state, granting the right to the American school to continue excavation. The excavation continued until today, every summer with a group of volunteers, mostly students in classic or archaeology. So now we have here, it's distorted too. So this is part of the digital map that we made. Um, shows you, so all, all the, the green is the houses that were, have been expropriated. So the law 1412, at the, the American zone was here with the store of Atos. You have the railway, was from the railway 
to the Acropolis, from the Titian Temple to the Stoa Battalos. So this area here has been excavated in the 1970s. And also here, between the railway and Adriano Street or Adrian Street, where the Royal Stoa was found, somewhere here. And in 1980, they moved the other side of Adriano Street. And this is where we still, they are still excavating today on this part, which is white now. Um, and this was, this is where the, the Swapikile is, the painted stoa. The, the, uh, so there's still a lot of adventure to be published. Um, I can show you a little bit the excavation methods, maybe as a, excavating in the heart of a city is a different matter than compared to digging in a field in the middle of nowhere where one could easily lay out a grid. So the practical and technical aspect presented a significant challenge and required an exceptionally well-developed system for recording. The Alois team was a pioneer in this matter and very innovative for its time and serve later as a model for other excavations. It was also one of the first excavation to use photography for the objects and for making quick snapshot on the site. As I mentioned before, the section were given a Greek letter and all the recording system of the Agora is based on the section and it's still today. So here's one of the first notebook uh, you can see and they still use uh, those notebook. So you see the section alpha here. And here is, they started as it, uh, with drawings of the finds because that was the usual method till then. But soon, fortunately soon they used the photography. So here we have, uh, Photograph of each objects was done. So in objects were cataloged based on their section number. So each section had uh, objects number one. So if, we, if we are in section alpha, you would have alpha one, alpha two, alpha three. And then the objects were given an inventory number according to the material. So pottery were given a P number sculpture S number and et cetera. So, and all the, the information in the notebooks were typed on a card and you have uh, a card for each objects. Today, as an information, today there's 100,000 objects and catalog and 80, about 80,000 coins. But the other thing they did was that they used photography to photograph the houses. So not only the objects in the excavation, but they photographed the houses. And you can see houses uh, and they mentioned the cadaster number and the, so it was, a way to be able to reconstruct this neighborhood was a big help. And so here another example of uh, another section, another notebook. So they had paste uh, part of the map with the cadaster number and the little delta that you couldn't see on the, on the green map, we're showing you it's two stories and duplicate Katikia and then Monokatikia is the M. So you have, so we knew which which one were one story and which one was double story. So there's a lot of information, which was quite a puzzle, but all the information was there. So here, another example of the notebook with the images of the houses. And at the end, so here we have a, a photographer taking pictures. Um, the I read that the Leica, we call them Leica negative because the Leica were one of the first 
photograph uh, camera that uh, was was small, so you could carry it on excavation. So it was very popular for archaeologists. So the um, the office of the American School occupied the top floor of this tower of Atalos, and the bottom part is the museum and the offices of the Greek uh, service. Um, so I hope that you visit the Agora one day if you've never been, and mostly go to the um, Stoa Vatalos and see the wonderful uh, exhibition there. Thank you. Thank you so much, Sylvie. Um... I, I have a couple burning questions myself mm -hmm. based on your, okay. your talk, um, but I'd like to also open it up. Um, if anybody would like to ask a question or leave a comment, you're welcome to use the chat function or the Q&A function. Um, I'll be monitoring those. Um, and Sylvia, I also appreciate your patience here. If you're not aware, um, in Nashville we are we are snowed in, so we're running this from yeah, my yeah, phone. Yeah. So I'll be poking That's some okay. buttons throughout no as well. No um, I do want to do a quick shout out. Sylvie also has a wonderful book called Rasaki that details this story even further. Yeah. Um, I'll start off with a question and give everyone a minute to type some of their questions or thoughts up. Mm -hmm. Um the records at Agro Excavations, I know you're very familiar with them, of course, but um, the notebook pictures and photographs just sort of um, inspired me to wonder, was there, was there a moment looking through the records that made you wonder what happened to these or made you wonder where was this that kind of sparked this project? Could you talk a little bit about that? How oh, this, oh, this project start? Oh, wow. Well. It's um, it's a combination of things because I was living in the neighborhood just behind the temple in, for ten years in a neoclassical house, um, and one day I bought a, a book um, about Tisian neighborhood and it was called Tisian, but I couldn't find the name of the street of that he was mentioning, and. Uh, and by chance, six months later, I started working at the Agora and Jan Jordan, who was the registrar at that time, she showed me the mounted file, which I didn't show, but it was too much material. But there was also a collection of, of uh, large uh, glass plate uh, images. And she showed me that. And by looking at the labels, I saw the name of the street and then connected and through through the my year in the Agora, I got interested in, you know, making some kind of catalog uh, of making because the photographs as you saw were by section. So there was if somebody would come in and say my house was on Eponiman Street, it would have been it could have been twelve sections. So it was difficult. So I was aiming to do a kind of a catalog, and then the idea of the book came later because. Uh, finding out that the archive at the American school was so rich and there was so much information. So then at the, at the American school, you have the negotiation, you have the correspondence, you have the law. It's an amazing a box and box and box of, of information. <laughs> People can go back. And, <laughs> and we have a list of, of the wonderful things. We have a list of owners and tenants and what they were, how many members of family and et cetera, et cetera. So it's very, it's unbelievable. Yeah, that's great. Um, I, I'm also curious, um, you mentioned that the goal was to excavate the, well, first of all, find the Agora, wherever yeah. it was back, uh, yeah. <laughs> based on the, the lot, to find the Agora. Um, basically mm -hmm. excavate it, build a museum, and landscape it in 42 years. <laughs> then the war it's interrupted. 10 those... years. They had oh, 10 yeah, in, ten, in 10 years, years you're right. Yeah, and then... but it didn't take 10 years. Yeah, it was... <laughs> it, took a little... yeah, yeah. it took a little bit longer, of course. 
Yeah. Um, I'm curious if you have thoughts about um, the the overall change from kind of neighborhood that, you know, of course, one of the sources said, oh, it's a, basically an eyesore, right? It's, yeah. uh, um, and now it's this kind of um, oasis, a, a park in Athens. So I wonder if you could talk a little bit more about that difference and sort of what we what we lost but what we gained as well well we gained a beautiful archaeological park which now with the landscaping uh it's beautiful and yeah the park uh of course and you have this experience of walking in like in an ancient city let's say or walking in a store of course uh, you know one opinion is that if if they would not have excavated in 1931. Uh, in the 60s, there was a frenzy of construction uh, with the colonels, if you know the story. And uh, it could be covered with uh, with modern buildings today. So it would have lost this information. So it, it's difficult to make, to take a position. Uh, yeah. this kind of, but there's a lot of expropriation in the world. I mean, for airport, and I was reading that Rockefeller himself relocated 4,000 people to make the Rockefeller, uh, you know, Radio City. And so, I mean, it's it's not something that uh, unusual. Yeah. yeah, but yeah. of course, uh, but yeah, there's, there's a lot of sadness. And it was, I must say, it was difficult when I did this research. It, it makes you very sad. And, but, yeah, but the, today you have to appreciate that the ancient you know, city is also quite important to know about it and the Agora has yeah. very much importance. Well, and I think it just lends um, importance to the fact that having you organize the information and research where things were, I mean, that helps the the families that were you know moved when their properties were expropriated this kind of tells their story right so having that information available researched and presented in such a cohesive way not only in in, in English the copy I have but in Greek too it it really kind of keeps the the story of the neighborhood alive which I think is really an incredible feat that a, a resource that we have yeah we we were lucky that. It's amazing that the American archaeologists did that. I mean, take picture mm -hmm. of houses and keep so much information. I mean, I think it's quite unusual. I don't know. I don't know how about the other side, but like Delphi, I know there was a village there. But uh, I think the the amount of information they kept it's really so rich that it does give us the uh, opportunity to rebuild this uh, neighborhood. So. So, I, but of course, it's lost. And <laughs> yeah, we have some very lovely comments. Um, okay. offering congratulations and a, saying a very interesting and good presentation. Um, I'll now offer a final call. If you have any other thoughts, comments, or questions, use this time to okay. um to submit those. We have a question from Brian Martin saying hello from Scotland. Thank you yeah. for the terrific talk, Sylvie. In addition to the houses in Visaki, what types of businesses and shops were located there? Oh, there. Um, I don't remember everything, but there was uh, cobblers, a lot of cobblers, a lot of cobblers. Uh, there was a, a mirror a mirror factory. There was a, one for wedding uh, uh Browns. Um, there was a box factory. So the, there were small factories, but the bigger one was a box factory and uh, the uh, and a flower factory. The flower factory, the flower meal was actually where it's excavating today. Uh, but there was a lot of uh, people, you know, small um, people doing things with their hands, but there was no heavy industrial uh, factories in this factory. This was mostly in the which is a little more west. 
So there was no heavy metal, uh, not music, but uh, <laughs> heavy metal factories and uh, things like that. Yeah. Yeah. From a busy ancient marketplace to a yeah. busy 19th century <laughs> neighborhood and, and still today. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. But there were bakeries, uh, bakeries, cafes, restaurants, and cinema, as I said, and, and a wine shop, you know, where you could eat and drink wine. There was, and or buy wine, and there was mm -hmm. a lot of little places I call it like that wine shop. So, um, I have one final um, question. Could you tell us anything about um, an exhibit coming up about the Versace neighborhood? Yeah, that's yeah. We're where well, we hope it will happen in April uh, twenty twenty four until the end of July. Uh, so there would be we hope uh, and I hope to show more objects than photographs, not only photographs. So there will be a lot of small surprises and uh yeah we'll be we'll see we will see uh because the archaeologists didn't keep much objects from the 1930s I mean, they didn't catalog them so it was hard to find objects that, but there were few we succeed to to so <laughs> to save we'll see so we'll be in touch about that yeah Okay. Um, a final question here um, from Bridget Pierce um, saying, great presentation. Uh, they studied classical archaeology in college and have been to the Agora. So yeah. it was awesome hearing about it from a, this more modern perspective. Mm -hmm. And they were wondering um, if there was a certain area that citizens that were expropriated moved to or did they spread throughout the city? Are there, is there any documentation about that? Yeah, they they discussed to buy some lands and move them all together somewhere. But that was uh one of the ministers said, no, no, they, they don't want that. They <laughs> they want to go wherever they want. So one of the uh I think we met two persons and they said they moved to Tision, which is next, was not very far. Um so we don't really know where they went. But they had, and there were many, many tenants, but many owners they didn't actually live in this neighborhood. So they were renting the house, but they were not. So, so they, so it's hard to to make an approximation of exactly, yeah, what happened. Um, we have a lovely comment from Amalia Kakisi saying, fantastic lecture, great archive research and sleuthing. Looking forward to the exhibit. Other um, yeah. <laughs> Anne McCabe has says, thank you, Sylvie, for a wonderful talk. Looking forward to the exhibition. And has a question um, from Amalia. Are there plans for the exhibition to go abroad? Will it travel? Oh, my God. I don't know yet. I don't think so. <laughs> we will see. We will try to make this one in Kolonaki. And if we succeed that one, yeah, we will. We can talk about it. Yeah. <laughs> Hopefully <laughs> we can go to the Getty. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> or maybe a museum in Nashville. <laughs> oh, Nashville. Yeah. <laughs> That's a great idea. I'd love yeah. to see the Parthenon. The Parthenon <laughs> will be great. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, Sylvie, thank you so much for sharing your um your thoughts and stories and images today with with the, our with the Parthenon and our audience for a virtual symposium. Um, I'd like to thank the um, Metro Nashville Parks and Recreation, Humanities Tennessee, and Centennial Park Conservancy for supporting our symposia series and our Roll of a Replica exhibit, which is on display um, throughout this year and perhaps even 2025 if you find oh. yourself in Nashville. Here's your invitation Great. to come see it in person. Um, Sylvie, thank you so much for this morning or this evening for you. We really appreciate hearing about 
Versace um, and the neighborhood uh, above the Agora, as well as the restoration of the stoa within it. So thank you very much. Thank you to you. Thank you. And goodbye. Bye. Thank you, everyone. Bye. Bye. Thanks for watching. Be sure to subscribe to our YouTube channel so you're the first to know about all the exciting things happening at the Nashville Parthenon.